and welcome to the Dental Protection Podcast. In this episode, we're bringing you previously popular conversations concerning various junctures or periods in a typical dental career journey. I'm your host, Dr. Noel Kavanagh, a senior dental educator in dental protection. And in this episode, I was joined once again by Dr. George Wright, dental legal consultant and deputy dental director at dental protection. Myself and George chatted about some of the potential risks associated with moving or changing dental practices and also we explored some risk management tips and strategies to help with this. Thanks Noel and uh, delighted of course to talk with you again. So George can I begin by asking what type of issues do you come across when supporting members both principals and associates when someone leaves a practice? Yeah, absolutely, Neil. So at Dental Protection, we're regularly asked for advice when disagreements arise between colleagues, especially, um, of course, between principals and associates. This can be particularly challenging when the parties have parted company, and usually, you know, on on amicable terms, but it does happen that they part on what, what we could say less than amicable terms. I think it's fair to say that some of the resultant issues and disputes could perhaps have been mitigated if there were more clearly defined and thought through parameters in place uh, from the outset. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, Some of our listeners may be familiar with Stephen Covey and his seminal book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. In it, he talks about beginning with the end in mind. Um, When starting out in in a practice, it might seem like an odd time to be considering your exit strategy. However, you know, good risk management tells us this is possibly the best time to reflect upon and, and plan for different possible scenarios that may arise. So I presume, George, it's always best practice to have a robust contract in place, whether as a self-employed associate or even as an employee. Yeah, correct, Noel. And, you know, of course, whilst dental protection wouldn't advise on uh, contracts um, specifically, you know, we do see from time to time issues arising. And so, you know, there are a number of features that that I could certainly highlight that might be helpful for uh, members to consider. So normally we'd um, suggest, you know, you have a section of clauses concerning termination, uh, some of the uh, non-exhaustive issues for both associate and principal to consider and discuss at the beginning of a professional relationship might include things like does your associate contract say uh, a a certain notice period if you want to leave um, for either you or or for the practice to give you notice are there any restrictive covenants after departing the practice i.e you know stopping you from working within a specific uh, geographical radius now these are things that you might not consider an issue whilst you're going into a relationship but often you know if you do decide to leave you don't want to be in a situation where you're too restricted on where you can move to. So uh, what are the financial arrangements for outstanding patient bad debts when you leave? Um, What else, gosh, have you considered how both parties would negotiate any disputes between yourselves? Um, And then uh, a few more just uh, just for the sake of completeness, what are the arrangements for providing locum cover for sickness or parental leave? Many contracts place this onus on the associate, which can add additional stresses at an already difficult time. Mm. How are the costs going to be shared? So um, in, in a former practice I worked at, uh, there were obviously lab fees to, to consider, but also I would refer patients to my hygienist. So how are those fees and costs going to be shared? Yes. And then finally, will the practice retain any of the fees from your final payment for provision of any remedial treatment? And how are they going to manage that fund? How are they going to inform you of any patient remedial treatment that's necessary? So, I mean, unfortunately, dentists are not provided with any training in this area prior to qualification. And we do see instances of disputes between parties that unfortunately can escalate rapidly and become bigger than perhaps they they need to be. So, uh, you know, I'd really encourage anyone starting in a new role to have their contract reviewed by a suitably qualified legal professional and just make sure that fundamentally they're entering into an agreement that they're comfortable with. Yeah, well, sounds like very, very good advice. I mean, do the dental council, do they have anything to say on this topic of leaving or, or moving practice? Yeah, actually, interestingly, they they do. The Dental Council's recently updated code of practice, in fact, relating to professional behaviour and ethical conduct states, um, and I think it's 14.1, that if you leave your dental practice, you must arrange continuing care for your patients who are undergoing active treatment. With your patient's consent, you should transfer care to a colleague 
or arrange to refer your patient to another dental professional. And then at 4.7, uh, they say that if you accept a patient for treatment, you must do your best to complete the agreed course of treatment safely and to a satisfactory standard. Now, these are therefore important considerations to bear in mind when leaving a practice. You know, are, are all outstanding treatment plans completed? If not, what are the arrangements for continuity of clinical care? You know, maybe you've had a specific clinical interest, such as short-term or aesthetically focused or focused orthodontics. You know, will your successor or someone else at the practice be able to even provide follow-up care for the treatments that you're you're leaving behind? Mm. I suppose the, the simplest way of overcoming the difficulties thrown up by continuity of patient care is to plan your exit from a practice well in advance. So, you know, it's back to that point we've just been making null about, you know, have it all agreed really from the outset. And by doing that, you can notify your patients ahead of time, and this will help you to avoid any surprises. And really, this approach may also allow you to refer complex treatment plans to colleagues, and it just helps to avoid the patient having to change clinician mid-treatment, which we know can generate additional complexities. Yes, absolutely. As we both know, George, robust record keeping is one of the central pillars in clinical risk management. And we certainly talk a lot about it here at Dental Protection. I'd imagine patient records can come, um, you know, very sharp focus when someone leaves a dental practice and a colleague takes over the care of their patients. Can you offer maybe our listeners any words of advice with this? Yeah, well, as you know, Noel, you and I both present our virtual records uh, workshops and we speak to colleagues on a regular basis around record keeping. Mm -hmm. And I think really there are two instances where your records really come into focus. And that is when you are in receipt of a complaint and you're wanting to refer back to your, your records and, and we'll come on to that. And then secondly, of course, when you leave and someone else takes over your treatment, as you said. So I think it can be helpful to ask yourself, are your clinical records of an adequate standard? And by that, I mean, you know, could they facilitate another practitioner stepping into your shoes and taking over where you've left off? Now, a helpful exercise can be to review some of the records from a few months back and really have a look at them in, in, with, with that in mind and consider whether you can easily understand what discussions you had with the patient, what treatment options were, dis uh, were explored or discussed, what, if any, indeed, risks and benefits were considered, and, and then what were the final agreed treatment plan? Now, if this basic information is missing, then it will make it harder for any dentists coming in to take over the patient's care. And of course, then just, you know, starts the ball rolling for patient con complaints, dissatisfaction and so on. And just when you mentioned complaints uh, there, George, again, I'd imagine this is also probably an area that could potentially cause issues when someone leaves a practice. Oh, yes, certainly. We, we do see a number of complaints that arise um, with new dentists coming in, dentists leaving practices. It's, it's just one of those uh, junctions in a dentist career where you can you know, you just higher risk, I think, for those kind of issues. And what practical strategies then would you advise for our members? Well, I think really it'd be prudent to have discussed what process is in place for any patient issues or complaints when you're no longer working at that practice. So, you know, for instance, will you be informed and asked for your comments? Will you be notified of all com complaints coming in from patients or just the ones the practice considers to be significant? Who's going to respond to the patient? Will it be you or the practice or, or a combined effort? And then finally, and this links back to what we were saying before about the, the contracts, if remedial treatment is required and the patient feels they shouldn't have to pay, um, or indeed the practice or, or principal feels feels likewise, then what financial arrangements are in place, um, especially regarding those retained sums? Of course, what if you disagree with the practice's approach to complaints? At Dental Protection, we, we do occasionally see difficult situations arise out of disagreements surrounding how complaints are handled, particularly after the treating clinician has, has left the practice. Now, mm. ordinarily, I'd say it's preferable for the practice to inform the treating dentist of any complaints made so that they can then provide a response to the patient, having an opportunity to review the records and, of course, contact us uh, for advice. The risk of the practice attempting to handle the complaint is, is twofold, really. On the, on, on the one hand, it's very challenging um, and, and actually ordinarily inappropriate for an individual not responsible for the treatment to comment on the clinical issues. Perhaps more significantly, I think the complaint may not be handled as the treating dentist would like, and this can occasionally cause unnecessary escalation of the complaint. It's unfortunately not uncommon, I think, for an outgoing dentist to first become aware of a complaint when it has escalated to a point where perhaps an earlier intervention to try and nip things in the bud has been lost. 
And I think really the way I look at it, Noel, is, is if, you know, my former practice had a complaint about treatment I provided, you know, I, frankly, I'd want to know about it. I'd want to have that opportunity to try and get in early and resolve things. Yeah, no, completely agree, George. I'd be, I'd be the same, actually. And tell me now, what about, um, you know, the practical scenario of patients wanting to follow a practitioner, maybe to, you know, to their new place of work or new practice? Well, that's a very good question, Noel, actually. And it's, I suppose it's not unusual um, when you leave a practice, particularly if you continue to work in the locality, that some patients may indeed wish to continue to, to see you. Patients do sometimes request the details of where you now practice. And again, what will the practice policy be? Can records uh, be forwarded? Of course, patients can request their records and, and facilitate that. But you know, you need to consider reference to ownership of the records. Uh, you know, who who is responsible for those records? It's also worth highlighting, I suppose, that the regulator, the Dental Council. Uh, have a view on this. And so again, in their 2022 code at 16.6, I think this one is, they state that you must not canvas patients directly or try to persuade patients to leave another dentist or practice. And that this is particularly important when a dentist is leaving a practice. You know, on, on the other side of the coin, you, you don't want to be seen as obstructive or evasive when asked by patients about where you're leaving to. It's, it's actually quite a difficult conversation to have when you're trying to be a bit cagey about, you know, your, your arrangements. And that can just raise unnecessary alarm with the patient. So a simple discussion with the practice principal to agree on what you can say when asked will avoid any unnecessary conflict. And again, that's one conversation you might want to be having right up front uh, yeah. when you're first joining the practice. So, you know, you may, for instance, wish to reach an agreement for patients undergoing treatments such as, you know, I mentioned short-term orthodontics or perhaps implant treatment, where it may be preferable for you to continue the treatment and avoid the patient having to switch dentists mid-treatment. Yeah, absolutely. And just before we wrap up this episode, George, any, any final tips to, to give our listeners? Um, yes, I think, unfortunately, when changing practices, it's not uncommon for issues to arise. You know, as with many of the dental legal issues we see here at Dental Protection, communication really is the key to early resolution and avoidance of any unnecessary escalation. You know, the value in parting on good terms can't be overstated. I think, you know, likewise, it's important to keep in touch with your, your former practice, particularly um, in the early days and months after your departure, just keeping them updated if your contact details change. Now, we know that you know, people do depart practices um, under uh, less than amicable terms, but the more you can do to try and just keep those channels of communications open and positive, I think, will stand you in good stead. And really, hopefully, by following some of these basic principles, changing practices can be easily managed with minimal stress. As always, of course, Dental Protection's team of dental legal experts remain on hand to answer any specific concerns that may arise before, during, or even long after you've moved on to passage new. And I'd really encourage anyone that's uh, facing any difficulties in this uh, situation to get in touch with us, really, and we'll, we'll have a chat. Yeah, no, super. So on that note, I'd like to thank George once again for sharing his thoughts and certainly very practical advice. Thank you for listening to this podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you have, please do tell your friends and colleagues. We're always interested to hear from you and do let us know if you have any ideas or suggestions for future podcasts. 